I want you to close your eyes right now and just fire up your imagination. I want to take you on a trip into my past. Uh, we're going to hop into a time machine, visit a few short scenes from my life. And while we're there, I want you to put yourself in my shoes. Look at what's around you. Uh, listen to the sounds. Breathe in the smells. Are you ready? Here we go. So the first stop is Christmas, the year 2000. Now looking back, it turns out this would be our second last Christmas with my dad. But that's not really why we're here. Each, each moment is special on its own merits. It's Christmas Day and we're gathered around our dining room table. On the table is the classic fare, hot mashed potatoes, savory turkey, warm gravy, uh, sweet cranberry sauce, yams with brown sugar and marshmallows, buns, vegetables, some sort of salad, some tasty juice, and since my grandma was still around, these ancient things called jello salads, uh, which are basically a dessert that you could eat before dessert. Um, if you zoom out a bit, you'll notice that gathered around the table is my family. Uncle Arnie, Auntie Lynn, uh, my grandparents, my mom, my dad, my sister, and myself. If you pay a little attention, you'll notice that hardly anyone's actually eating, even though the food is delicious. The truth is, we're all far too busy laughing to eat, since somebody has just told the most ridiculous story. Now, Bapa, my grandpa, was one of the most gifted storytellers I've ever known, and though the rest are a bit more shy about it, the rest of the family can spin a pretty good yarn as well. And it's in these moments that we're reminded once again how much we love each other, and how happy it makes us to all be together. Eating together can bring us joy and lasting memories. Did you know that simply eating together has been shown to increase self-esteem and decrease the likelihood of depression? I think it's true. And with all that in mind, I'd love to pull up a chair and stay a while, but unfortunately we can't. We've just got to keep on moving. The journey beckons us. Tragically, we can't even stay long enough to sample a bit of the turkey. We have to move on. So back into the time machine, Put on your seatbelt, hold on to the handles, and here we go. You can imagine a, a pile of smoke, strange sounds, and out we step. And you look around us and you see this, this campground surrounded by forest. You can hear a lake lapping through the woods not too far away, and, and you can smell that heavenly aroma of cooking meat. Now, around the campfire are two guys. One looks like me but about 10 years younger. And the other one is shorter and has an Australian accent. This was the day my buddy Dan called me up all excited and said he just bought some lamb steaks and was wondering if I knew a good place to cook them. Turns out that I did. And so he picked me up in his old Ford Bronco and we drove about an hour out in the bush, we lit a fire, we cooked our steaks. They were hands down the most delicious steaks I've ever had. And it's not just because they were lamb, although that certainly helped. It was because Dan and I were best friends, way out in the bush, on a crazy little adventure of manliness. We had some good laughs out there, came up with a, a foolproof plan on how we could uh, both find a wife, uh, and we talked deep for a while too. Then we went home. Eating together, outside in nature, you know, there's something special about it. The fresh air, the smells of the forest, the water, the campfire, the sun shining down and warming up your skin, the taste of I mean, almost anything at all as, as it rolls over your tongue and fills you up with satisfaction. Eating together out in the wild, it actually combines all these different factors. You know, the taste, the smells, the sights, the endorphins flowing from however you got to where you're at. All these things go to enhance the experience and the relationships being built. Unfortunately, we can't linger long. It's back to the time machine for us again. So buckle up and here we go. Smoke, sparks, hissing noises, time machine stuff. The door finally opens to a small Starbucks in Kelowna. Back when it was 
Good. <laughs> uh, we walk inside, we get hit with that amazing scent of fresh coffee, and just to the right, by the window, we notice two people with empty cups, deep in conversation. One of them looks like me, only dressed a fair bit dumber uh, and about 13 years younger, and the other one is a dark-haired girl with an accent about the same age. Her name was Sarah, and we met in kind of a weird sort of way. Uh, there I was, minding my own business, buying groceries from a local food market, when I came around the corner and somehow locked eyes with the girl that was stocking the fruits and vegetables. Uh, we both just stood there for a minute, kind of awkwardly frozen, and then said hi, and kept on doing what we had been doing. Now, it almost sounds romantic, but actually, it was like just mysteriously intriguing for me. Uh, it was the closest thing I'd ever experienced to deja vu. You know, I could have sworn I knew her from somewhere, but no matter what I came up with, nothing quite made sense. So, uh, the next week when I went back for groceries, she happened to be on till. Uh, and I found out that she'd experienced the exact same thing. And like me, she couldn't figure it out either. So, as she was checking my groceries, I asked if she wanted to go out for coffee sometime. She said yes, wrote her number on my receipt, and that's how we found ourselves at Starbucks for six hours. Uh, and maybe there was some mutual romantic interest in each other, but mostly I think we were just deeply curious. Like, who is this person? What are they all about? And so we talked and talked and talked. And as we talked, we learned more and more about each other. And fueled by coffee and conversation and baked goods, our friendship was established all in one afternoon. And to this day, though, I have not seen her for years. I would still count her as my friend, all because we took some time, put aside the rest of our lives that day, and ate and drank together. Maybe coffee's not your thing, though, and even if it is, it's time to go back to the time machine anyway, this time for a real big jump. Buckle in, set the dial, close our eyes, and whew, away we go. Steam, smoke, more hissing, you know the routine by now. Door opens, and, and maybe you're surprised to find yourself riding in an old wooden fishing boat with some hairy-looking fishermen wearing the robes of a poor first-century Jew. As the water splashes gently against the side of the boat, you squint your eyes, and you look towards the morning sun. One of the fishermen is talking. You listen closely and suddenly you realize who it is that you're fishing with. These hairy dudes are Jesus' disciples. They're talking about Jesus and how just a few days before, he had been brutally killed by the Romans. They talked about how despite that, his tomb was undeniably empty. And, and they talked about how Jesus had appeared to them and to a few others a few times since then, very much alive. They talk about these last three years that they've spent learning from him, listening to him, and walking every day alongside the Son of God. And they wonder to each other what's next. Uh, the page is obviously turning onto the next chapter in their lives, and, and the new chapter is beginning. But what exactly is this new chapter? All this talk, and you can tell these guys have just been fishing to blow off some steam, to vent a bit of stress. They probably don't even care that they've been out fishing all night without catching so much as a minnow. You begin to notice a faint smell in the air. And looking around, you see that a few others have picked it up too. As the boat continues drifting along, you begin to hear that familiar crackle of a fire across the water. And you realize that what you're smelling is a literal feast of fish that somebody's cooking up on the beach. As you look toward the campfire, the person stands up and waves his arms. Friends, he shouts toward the boat, have you caught any fish tonight? Nope, nothing tonight, shouts back one of the disciples. And throw your nets off on the other side of the boat. You'll catch some then, he shouts back. Well, slowly, a look of understanding begins to dawn on the faces of those around you as they hurry to do what the stranger has suggested. And as soon as they do, 
the boat begins to pull towards the net as so many fish fill up the net that the disciples can't even haul it back in. Now, as soon as he feels the pull, one of the disciples grabs his coat, shouts, It is the Lord! and jumps into the lake and starts swimming for the beach. Now, everyone else stays behind and decides just to tow the net instead of hauling it in. Uh, and they bring the boat towards the shore. And when they arrive, all their suspicions are confirmed. This mysterious stranger is indeed Jesus. And somehow, without ever getting into a boat, he's gathered up and cooked up a huge pile of fish and bread and has breakfast ready to go for the hungry and tired disciples. Jesus cared about eating with his friends. He liked to spend time together having fun, telling jokes and stories, sometimes getting deep, but all the time just enjoying every moment of each other's company. Now usually, when you think of Jesus, the first thing to come to your mind probably isn't eating. But it was actually a pretty big deal to him. There's lots of stories in the Gospels of how he would sit down and eat with the people, getting to know them, validating them, building up these deep and lasting friendships. I think that's one of the coolest things about Jesus. I mean, here was God, uh, the creator of the universe, the breather of life itself. And yet he liked people so much, he just wanted to hang out, eat food, and relax together. Well, we step back in the time machine, buckle up, turn the dial, and close our eyes. Hissing, sparks, and smoke are the indicator to us that we've returned home to our own time, right here, right now. And here we are. Uh, isn't that a wild adventure we had? And have we learned anything from our trips today? I hope so. I hope that you always remember this one important thing, that Jesus likes to eat together. Why is this important? The fact that Jesus likes to eat together tells me one big thing. Relationships matter to him. Now, there's a pretty cool promise that Jesus gives us in the book of Revelation. And it goes like this. It says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I'll eat with that person and they with me. What? I mean, this means that Jesus is not just interested in relationships and friendships with only certain special people. He's not just interested in relationships and friendships in general. Jesus is interested in a relationship and a friendship with you. Jesus isn't interested in a boss-employee relationship or a king-peasant relationship. I mean, check it out. John 15, 15 to 16 says, I don't call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, because I've made known to you everything I've heard from my Father. You didn't choose me. I chose you. God chose you. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart right now. If you're looking for the hands-down best relationship of your entire life, a friendship that will never fail, a God that won't let you down. Could I suggest that you open up the door of your heart, welcome him in, and sit down and eat together? Because if there's only one thing that you remember from this message today, just let it be this. Jesus loves to eat with his friends.